Assalamu alaikum. This is the fourth and the last video in the series about study techniques. We'll be talking here about, firstly, interleaving. Interleaving is, as the name indicates, interleafing something. Uh, we know about an interleaf copy. It is one page of lined. One page is lined and the other page is blank. It's, it's similarly, interleaving is a similar concept. You study different top, uh, different subjects over a period of time. You don't study anatomy for the whole day. For example, you study anatomy for some time and then you quit ch and change to a change the subject and go to physiology, and you change the subject, go to biochemistry, or maybe in one subject even you change the topic this way this is another research proven way of improved learning so one of the main pitfalls is switching between topics too quickly and not grasping a concept before we switch a topic so what you have to do is grasp a concept and then switch a topic not too quick not too slow we'll tell you about uh, what uh, we'll tell you about the proper interval that it should be done on one of the benefits is about uh, of interleaving is, is that it prevents burnout. So, uh, continuing, our, continuing our example from the second video about respiratory physiology. So, for example, we studied respiratory physiology for 40 minutes. We interleave and change to upper limb anatomy and study that for 40 minutes. And then we study amino acid biochemistry for 40 minutes. This is an example of interleaving and it's been research proven to improve outcomes in students. Another study technique is dual coding, which most of us already use. It is using multiple forms of media to hammer in a concept. For example, we have studied something from the book, then we, watch an at, uh, then we look at an atlas of diagrams of that, part of that topic, and then we watch a video to reiterate that topic as well. And then we do something else, maybe watch, watch flowcharts or any other form of media to input into our brain. And dual coding is, uh, this is what I, and dual coding is like coding a single piece of information through different uh, ways of input and this improves learning and it's also research proven. And the important thing is to actively review whatever you're doing. So rather than just watching a video passively, you try to question yourself while watching that video, while watching an atlas, while looking at an atlas, you don't just look at it, you go into it and ask yourself the questions about why and how and try to link it with the book, with the written material. This is how you would do dual coding actively. For example, uh, what we did was study the piece of respiratory physiology from the book. And now we look at the diagram of that similar concept. And in the book, it was written as the larger the alveolus, the lesser the surface tension is shown here in uh, with the diagram. This is an example of dual coding. The smaller arrow shows lesser collapsing force. And the collapsing force is determined by the law of Laplace. And the smaller alveolus is has a greater collapsing force, larger arrows. So this is another way of hammering in that concept about alveoli and the radius. So this is the coding of that concept. Third example, uh, another study technique is using concrete examples. Using easy to use daily life examples to explain a concept is what is concrete examples. One of the pitfalls to be aware of is not to use inaccurate examples to explain anything because that would uh, that would cause problems in your own concept and when you use that example to explain to someone else that would cause problems in their concept as well and it would mislead them so when using concrete examples to explain any topic what you need to do is uh, go to your supervisor or teacher and ask them if the example you have thought about is accurate scientifically. And if they say yes, then you use that example to explain it to yourself and to explain it to someone else. 
So we'll go about the same concept we've been going about in the past three videos, the respiratory physiology concept about the alveolus and the radius of the alveolus and the collapsing pressure on the alveolus. A simple example that comes to mind is that of a balloon. When you're blowing a balloon, when the balloon is smaller in its radius, when you start blowing a balloon, it's harder to blow into. That is because the balloon is smaller in its radius and has more surface tension, more collapsing pressure. But as the balloon increases in size, it becomes easier to blow into. So this is a very good concrete example to explain that concept. Like well, when you start blowing a balloon, the balloon is small, the radius is less, the collapsing pressure is more. When the balloon becomes bigger, it becomes easier to blow into. The collapsing pressure is lesser, the radius is larger. Similarly in alveoli, when the radius is smaller, the collapsing pressure is more and when the radius is larger, the collapsing pressure is less. The final study technique is rather not a study technique, but it's more tailored to our medical education. It's problem-based learning because whatever we're learning here, we have to apply it in our professional life, in our clinic. Most of us would choose the path to become clinicians so whatever we're learning, we have to apply it into our clinic, uh, <clears throat> apply, those, apply those concepts. So the <clears throat> newer, uh, newer thing that is coming into medical education, it's not new now, it's been uh, quite a while, is using problem-based learning. Like whenever you do a topic, you uh, use scenarios that would come into the clinic that are related to that topic and that reiterate and use the, use the knowledge that you have gained to find solutions to the problems. It's application of the knowledge, that is where problem-based learning is. Problem-based learning needs uh, uh, studying just one topic, you might not be able to apply problem-based learning. It is normally what, whatever you are doing in the clinic is accumulation of several different concepts and several different subjects. So the example we might give here might not be very accurate, but uh, we can try. So the example of respiratory physiology, putting it into putting into putting it into problem-based learning is like a seven-month-old infant shows sign of tachypnea, expiratory grunting, and nasal clearing after birth. These are the signs of respiratory distress syndrome in infants. <clears throat> So why is that? The, norm, the main cause of this is decreased surfactant. But we know that a seven month old infant is premature. So they would have smaller alveoli. So this is a smaller factor that also contributes to the respiratory distress syndrome in infants. Other than the absence of surfactant, because premature infants would have smaller alveoli, the alveoli have more collapsing pressure, and that is why those alveoli would be prone to collapse more as a nine month old infant who, ha who has larger alveoli and that has lesser collapsing pressure. This is one of the very small parts, but mainly respiratory distress syndrome is due to surfactant deficiency, which hasn't been uh, started being which hasn't started its production in a premature infant, so they have respiratory stress due to collapsing of the alveolus. So uh, th this is why I told uh, that problem-based learning needs two or more, uh, many, several concepts to be integrated into one. So, but this gets the point across that problem-based learning is the future. So whatever you do in your medical school, try to look up problem-based scenarios of that topic and try to solve them to get better understanding. You could go over the internet to find problem-based scenarios, you'd get them in your medical school as well. So the take-home message from this video series is to avoid highlighting and underlining as they are passive techniques. Go for active learning with different, with different uh, study strategies such as active recall, space repetition, elaboration, concrete examples, interleaving, dual coding, and problem-based learning. These active learning methods would feel difficult at the start, 
but would become easier as time goes on and as you practice them more and you would slowly and surely get uh, start reaping the rewards of them and you'd want to keep on going and you would ask yourself but why didn't you know these methods before so the take home message is study smart but not not hard you study smart, you study lesser amount of time, and you understand the topic better. You score at better tests, you become a better clinician, a better doctor, and you are able to balance your extracurricular and personal life as well. So this was all about study techniques. Thank you very much.